Hello everyone, and thank you for joining our webinar this morning about ERA's Natural Gas Challenge, Unlocking Innovation Across Alberta's Value Chain. My name is Mark Summers. I'm the Executive Director of Technology and Innovation for Emissions Reduction Alberta, and I'm the host of ERA's podcast, Carbon Copy. And I'm Steve McDonald, CEO of ERA. We are broadcasting today from ERA's headquarters in beautiful downtown Edmonton, Alberta. Steve and I will be passing the microphone back and forth during the presentation, and we'll both be available to answer questions during the live Q&A period at the end. Before we get into the agenda, I'd like to start by going through some housekeeping items to make sure we get the most out of our time. First, we're expecting around 200 participants today, so everyone's microphone is muted to avoid unintentional background noise. If you've dialed in by phone, please select the telephone option in the audio panel and enter your audio pin. If you encounter technical challenges related to the webinar connection, please email amanda at info at eralberta.ca and we will try to help where we can. As a final note, if you need to leave early or if you can't see the slides, we will be posting the webinar on ERA's website. This will include the presentation and the live Q&A with a full recording of the audio. For today's agenda, we plan to cover a few things that we hope will be useful for everyone on the line. First, Steve will provide a general overview of ERA. Next, we'll introduce the natural gas challenge that was launched on October 30th at Spark 2019 Carbon Positive Conference. We'll cover the scope and eligibility for the call, the submission process and timelines around ERA's funding decision. Third, we'll share some advice for anyone that's interested in making a submission. And finally, we'll end off by answering some of your questions. On that note, if you have any questions you would like us to address, type them into the questions pane of the GoToWebinar control panel. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can, but if we don't get to your question, you're very much welcome to follow up afterward. Now I'll turn it over to Steve to get things started by telling you about ERA. Thanks, Mark. I'd like to begin by talking a bit about how ERA fulfills the vision, mandate, and value proposition that you see on this slide. We were established 10 years ago and originally known as the Climate Change Emissions Management Corporation. But ERA has been the mechanism for investing the carbon price paid by large industrial emitters into clean technology solutions that help Alberta, Canada, and the world achieve climate change goals. The original policy rationale for the creation of ERA was grounded in the reality that climate change goals are so ambitious that they can only be achieved by accelerating the development and deployment of new technologies. Over the years, governments have changed, climate policy and goals have shifted, and regulatory frameworks have been modified. But one of the constants has been a commitment to use public dollars to leverage the significant investments required to identify and scale up the innovation needed to ensure that Alberta succeeds in a lower carbon world. Just two weeks ago, Minister Jason Nixon introduced Alberta's new Technology Innovation and Emissions Reduction System, fondly referred to as TIER. TIER is the centerpiece of the government's upcoming climate strategy, and it creates a new framework that maintains a price on carbon to help energy intensive facilities find innovative ways to reduce emissions and invest in clean technology. The last point I wanna make on this slide is that our vision is anchored, anchored in our belief that our success is measured in both economic and environmental outcomes. We fondly refer to this as our the genius of and vision. In other words, our investment, investments are designed to improve the carbon and cost competitiveness of Alberta. As I mentioned, our projects align with Alberta's economic and environmental priorities. To ensure this alignment, ERA has created a technology roadmap to guide our investment decisions and inform our portfolio mix. And it's a living document. We review it regularly and refine it to ensure that we are being responsive to the needs of the province's industries, innovators, and investors. The roadmap helps us define the pathways, opportunities, and the barriers to allow Alberta to thrive in a low carbon future. It also helps us lay out the tactical options for delivering the right solutions and identify the key milestones and deliverables to measure success. And this includes mechanisms to communicate and demonstrate our progress. A copy of our roadmap can be found on our website if you want to explore it in greater detail. As you can see on the screen, 
our areas of focus cover all sectors where there are significant emission reduction opportunities. And our portfolio includes opportunities across multiple time scales. Some have immediate impacts in Alberta by creating jobs and reducing emissions, in fact, before the project is even finished. These projects are exciting because they are tangible and the results are quantifiable now. They are really about doing the same thing better. We are also looking at some truly transformative opportunities that can change the very face of an existing industry. But we also invest in groundbreaking technologies that don't address an, address an immediate industry need, but rather they create new industries, new economic activity, and new jobs. They can grow the economy without growing emissions. At our SPARC conference last month, Minister Nixon announced two great examples of this diversity in our portfolio. The first was our Grand Challenge Round 3 announcement. Two projects will share 10 million after competing in, a in our five-year competition to find the world's most innovative technologies to turn carbon dioxide from a waste stream into valuable products. Mangrove water technologies and carbon cure technologies are potential game changers in the emerging industries around carbon utilization. The second announcement was the natural gas challenge that we're chatting with you today. Partnerships are central to our success and are critical to delivering on our commitment to drive commercialization. They help us to convey the right resources and bridge the gaps on technology, business, financial, and capacity challenges. Equally important, partnerships enable us to align efforts so we can limit duplication in the innovation system. They also help us leverage funds so we can maximize the, vet, the level of our investments and share risk to accelerate technology development. In fact, when you provide ERA with your funding submission, you have the opportunity to have your submission shared and considered by other, other funding organizations such as Alberta Innovates, SDTC, and the Natural Gas Innovation Fund. Mark will talk a bit more about this shared opportunity. So lastly, I want to share with you some of the results that ERA has achieved. This slide gives you a sense of our portfolio mix across our four focus areas. Since our inception in 2009, we have committed $557 million to support 169 projects valued at $4.3 billion. This large project project value is reflective of the fact that ERA tends to focus on later stage technology with high capital costs. It also reflects our ability to leverage seven to one funding from project partners. But more important than these activity measures are the outcomes we are achieving. We are on track to deliver cumulative GHG reductions of 41 million tons by 2030. These investments will also lead to the creation of the equivalent of over 22,000 person year jobs by 2023 and contribute over 3.2 billion to Alberta's GDP. Well, so I hope you now have a bit more context on who we are, uh, the outcomes we're trying to achieve and how we work to identify and accelerate technologies. With that, I'll go and hand this back to Mark who will give, we'll get into the details of our latest funding challenge. All right, thank you, Steve. Let me start by saying that this call for proposals is focused on challenging innovators to bring forward their best ideas to have an impact across Alberta's natural gas value chain from production to market. Natural gas is a critical resource and the government of Alberta is committed to revitalizing the sector. Our province's substantial natural gas resource base, highly skilled workforce and access to Canadian and international capital creates an opportunity for Alberta it, an opportunity for Alberta to be well positioned to be a world leader in the natural gas movement. However, we know that Alberta's natural gas industry faces competitive pressures due to low commodity, price, commodity prices, market access, as well as global greenhouse gas reduction targets. So ERA's natural gas challenge was designed to advance novel technology to help alleviate these pressures and bolster the resilience of Alberta's natural gas industry. To help define the scope of this natural gas challenge, ERA hosted two workshops, one in person and one over webinar that included industry, innovators, government, and other experts. What we heard was that tremendous opportunities exist to decrease emissions, increase competitiveness, and tackle the barriers to advancing technology. 
And in this challenge, we're making up to $50 million available for technology advancement projects across Alberta's natural gas value chain. Again, from production to market, everything from the reservoir and the wellhead to the distribution and the consumer. ERA's $50 million will be leveraged with industry funding and private investment to generate more than $100 million in new investment for Alberta's natural gas industry. Up to $10 million will be made available for individual projects. Now, of course, as is our mandate, all projects funded through this call must demonstrate significant potential to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and grow Alberta's economy. To give you a sense for the types of projects we expect to see in this call, a list of examples is provided here and in the Call for Expressions of Interest document. To be clear, these are just examples and are not exhaustive. I fully anticipate that some great opportunities will come in that we did not foresee. In fact, I'm often delighted to see new and fantastic ideas that I didn't know were out there. In any case, some examples include new technology for natural gas production and processing, uh, addressing leaks and fugitive emissions, novel alternatives to flaring and venting, as well as first-of-kind industrial efficiency improvements in the natural gas industry. Also augmenting Alberta's natural gas supply with either renewable or synthetic natural gas. And of course, there are plenty of downstream opportunities well, as well, including both the transportation of natural gas itself to existing or new markets, as well as the use of natural gas as a fuel for transportation and mobility. And of course, the use, the use of natural gas as an input for value-added opportunities like hydrogen and petrochemicals. Now, I should mention that while it's not listed here, we've already had some questions about the use of carbon capture or CO2 utilization at natural gas facilities. And the quick answer is yes, we would love to see those ideas. Of course, if they're targeted at greenhouse gas reduction emissions reductions from the natural gas industry. So let me talk about some important eligibility considerations for a minute. The first is that, and I want to emphasize this, that we fund capital P projects with clear objectives, milestones, timelines, deliverables, and a budget. The goal is to take technology from point A to point B in terms of accelerating it toward commercialization. So for example, we don't fund ongoing operations or open-ended programs like a five-year research program, for example. The maximum project length for this call is three years. In terms of technology readiness, we're looking for projects that involve field piloting, demonstration, or first-of-kind commercial implementation of innovative technology. And we know that good ideas and good technology can come from anywhere. So applicants and technology providers can be from Alberta, from across Canada, or even internationally based. And proposals are invited from really any kind of applicant, including technology developers, industry, industrial associations, large organizations, small and medium enterprises, research and development organizations, universities, municipalities, not-for-profits, and even individuals. However, I wanna make sure this is clear. While technologies and applicants can come from anywhere, they must be piloted, demonstrated or deployed here in Alberta. And finally, uh, I should mention that we encourage collaboration. Partnerships are both eligible and encouraged to apply, uh, to apply. This can be partnerships between industry operators and technology developers, for example, but can also involve post-secondary institutions and others that will add value to the project and to the province. So as I mentioned, we have $50 million available for this natural gas challenge with up to $10 million per project. We also have a minimum funding request for this challenge and that is $250,000 for any individual project. As is our standard practice, we will match eligible expenses on up to a one-to-one -one basis, meaning that for every dollar that the applicant and partners put into a project, we can put in up to $1 also. We have a detailed eligible expense guidelines document on our website that outlines what expenses are eligible and what are not eligible. This document will be more important at the full project proposal stage of the process, but I encourage you to take a look now just to make sure there aren't any big surprises on your end as you go through the process. 
And as always, we only match costs on a go-forward basis. This means that any costs incurred before ERA's funding approval will not be considered eligible. Finally, uh, I also want to emphasize that this is a highly competitive process, and unfortunately, not all projects will be approved for funding. In fact, every one of ERA's call for proposals over the last 10 years has been oversubscribed in terms of the total funding request relative to the total funding available. We often receive 10 times more in funding requests than we have available. So it's important that applicants make a strong case for why their project should be funded. ERA has a rigorous selection process with a team of experts who evaluate the challenge submissions and help pick the best opportunities for ERA. So I'll summarize our submission and evaluation process here. And on the next slide, I'll talk about the timelines of this process. As you can see in the diagram, we have a two-stage evaluation process followed by execution of the project. In the expression of interest phase, applicants are invited to provide an overview of their proposed project. This is a relatively short document with eight pages maximum and must be submitted using our online system by the December 19th deadline. Please note that we will not extend the deadline and we will not accept late submissions. So please pay attention to the deadline. After all the EOIs have been submitted, they are evaluated by a team of independent experts with subject matter expertise in business, in financing, science, engineering, and also greenhouse gas quantification. After the EOI evaluation process, a short list of projects will be invited to submit a full project proposal, or FPP as we call it, which includes more detail about the technology, the proposed project, and the expected outcomes of the project. At the full proposal stage, an advisor from ERA is assigned to each proposal in order to help guide applicants through the process and provide feedback if requested for both the full proposal as well as the oral presentations while they're both under development. After the full proposals are submitted, they are again evaluated by an independent team of experts and all applicants at this stage will be invited to offer a face-to-face -face presentation to the entire evaluation team. This process culminates with an in-depth review meeting where all projects are discussed in great detail and a recommendation is ultimately brought forward to our board of directors for consideration. All funding decisions in this call will be made by ERA's board of directors. And then after the funding decisions are made, we enter into a legal agreement with each of the successful applicants that details the terms and obligations of each party as it relates to our contribution and to the recipient's completion of the project. ERA's funding is then dispersed on a milestone by milestone basis, and the progress of each project is monitored and reported to ERA throughout the course of the project. At the end of each project, all recipients are required to produce a final outcomes report, which is ultimately shared publicly for the broader benefit of Alberta. And the final thing to note about our process is that the entire process is overseen by an independent fairness monitor that reports directly to ERA's board of directors. <clears throat> and the timelines for this process are shown on this slide here. Everything related to the evaluation happens between now and May of 2020. The deadline for submissions is December 19th at 5 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. And that's 5 p.m. sharp. Our online system automatically closes submission functionality right at the deadline. And again, I'm sorry to repeat this, but please note that we will not be extending the deadline and we will not accept late submissions. Once you've submitted your application, you'll receive an email from the system to confirm that your submission has been received. If you don't receive that email, please go back in and double check that your submission was properly completed. It may be that something was missing or something was incorrectly completed. This is why we strongly encourage you to get your submissions in early. After the EOI stage, shortlisted projects will be notified in February of 2020 and will have until sometime in April to provide full project proposals. The oral, presentation, the oral presentations will be scheduled for late April or early May of 2020. Okay, so the last thing I wanna talk about before we take your questions 
is some advice on how to prepare a successful proposal. First, and probably foremost, I would recommend that you start the process now. From now until the submission deadline, December 19th again, there are about five weeks. We know that it doesn't take five weeks to put together an eight-page proposal. However, it does take time to forge partnerships, to get internal approvals, and to allocate resources. And while you don't need to have every internal approval and every partnership finalized by the submission deadline, the further along you are in these processes, the better off you are in terms of demonstrating that your project is real and ready to advance. Since all submissions need to be completed through our online portal, please go there to register an account if you don't have one already. It's open for submission now. You could submit an application today if you wanted. Okay, next, and I really can't emphasize this enough, is please read the Call for Expressions of Interest document. It's not a long document, it's about 12 pages, and honestly, it answers most of the questions that we get on a regular basis. If you have a project that's not eligible or doesn't fit with this particular call for proposals, you can save yourself some time by reading the guidelines document and figuring that out early. So this next point is really an extension on the last one, and that is to review the evaluation criteria, which are provided in the call for EOIs document. These are the criteria upon which each proposal will be evaluated and shortlisted in this process. And each of these criteria have different weightings. While they are all important and all need to be addressed in the EOI document, I encourage you to consider the relative weightings when completing your proposal. And building on that point, when you're completing the EOI document, it's important to use clear language and to address all of the points laid out in the template document. We've put in some effort to point out the important information that you should include in your proposal. My strong advice to you is to address all of those points in the template and address them clearly. While our evaluation team consists of subject matter experts, if they can't decipher the information that's necessary to make a qualified assessment, or if the eight page document is filled with extraneous information, they won't have the confidence necessary to move the application forward in the process. And speaking of the eight page limit, I think it's also worth noting that you're most welcome and encouraged to include optional letters of support. These letters of support don't count toward the eight page limit and in some cases can be quite beneficial. And last, but certainly not least, is please do not wait until the last day to submit your application. I can tell you that we have lost good opportunities in the past because of deadlines that were missed. Our deadline is a matter of fairness to all applicants and is something that we are firm on. If you have technical issues during the submission process, our IMS team is quite happy to help resolve those technical issues, and we try to be very responsive to the requests that come in. However, I can assure you that if you wait until the last day, it's entirely possible we won't be able to address all of the last minute issues that arise. And finally, before I move on to the questions, I wanna take a minute to talk about leveraging funding from our trusted partners. As Steve mentioned, ERA works in partnership with other funding organizations like Alberta Innovates, SDTC, and Natural Resources Canada. In some cases, there may be an opportunity for ERA to share your proposal with our trusted partners and explore the possibility to leverage funding available from these organizations. During the submission process, you'll have the opportunity to allow us to share your submissions with our trusted partners, and I encourage you to do so. If you agree to this in the system, ERA will only share your application with partners where we have a non-disclosure agreement in place and for the sole purpose of exploring further funding leverage. Now this call in particular is very well aligned with the Natural Gas Innovation Fund. It was launched simultaneously with a $3 million funding opportunity from NGIF and has the same deadline for submission of proposals. When you go through ERA submission process, you will also have the opportunity to indicate whether you want your proposal shared directly with NGIF for consideration in their funding competition. In their funding competition. I encourage you to visit NGIF's NGIF's website for more information. 
All right. Well, if you've made it this far, uh, and if you're still awake, this is your opportunity to ask questions of Steve and me. Please type your questions into the questions pane of the control panel, which is typically on the right-hand side of your screen. For this part of the agenda, we're, we're joined by the newest full-time member of the ERA team, Isabella Tarasco, who will be sifting through the questions and reading them out loud for all of us to answer. Good morning, Isabella. Good morning, everyone. So while you get your questions in, let me mention that we're going to try answering the questions that have the most value for the entire audience here. So if you have questions about the process or anything we've mentioned, or even about ERA in general, that's great. If you have questions about the specific eligibility of your technology or your project, please note that we probably won't be able to address those on this webinar. All right, Isabella, over to you. What questions do we have coming in? Uh, the first question we had was from Cameron Young. Uh, would successful projects under the challenge be eligible for participating in offset protocols of the tier? Yeah, um, that's an important question and that's one that we did not address. So thank you for that. Um, there's There are certainly some nuances there and some details about the recently announced tier framework that have, have yet to be uh, detailed. And so there, there may be some changes in this regard. But typically speaking, if a project is uh, awarded for funding by ERA, it does not restrict your ability to either A, have those reductions count toward the compliance obligation of the large industrial facility, if it happens to be at one of the facilities that will be captured by the tier regulation, or B, uh, generate offset credits if it happens to be at a non-large industrial emitter site or one that isn't captured by the what's currently the CCIR regulation or um, going forward the tier regulation. Thank you. We have another question from Nicola Rossetti. Uh, eligible projects are strictly related to natural gas supply chain or are projects um, in other sectors applicable as well? Uh, so it'd be, I'd be interested to hear specifically what you're thinking about in that and happy to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Overall, I would say that this, is, this call is primarily focused at improving the competitiveness and greenhouse gas uh, footprint of Alberta's natural gas industry. But that, that industry is broad and spans, you know, as, as I mentioned previously, right from the reservoir and the wellhead all the way to uh, downstream opportunities, distribution and, and consumers, and even value add opportunities like petrochemicals and creation of, of hydrogen. I, I think there are, there are probably some opportunities along that, that spectrum um, or even as an extension of that where there may be some gray area, such as uh, using natural gas for different applications. But you know, we, we already talked about specifically natural gas for transportation or natural gas for chemicals or natural gas for hydrogen. So if there are other innovative opportunities, we encourage you to share those with us. If you, if you don't want to go to the effort um, right away to put together an eight page proposal you're, you're welcome to follow up with us offline afterward and we're, we're we're happy to have a conversation with you but but my what my suggestion would be that if it's related to natural gas and related to the natural gas industry in alberta and is an opportunity for greenhouse gas reductions and for improving the competitiveness of alberta and alberta's natural gas resources uh, then it's worthwhile taking a shot and submitting your application and seeing what happens. Yeah, and the only thing I'd add to that is that we do create a, an inventory of ideas that don't make it to the second stage. And so by providing a submission that aligns with the purpose of the call, you do put your technology on our radar and we are always open to follow up with uh, all applicants to talk about the strengths and weaknesses of their projects. And those inventory of unsuccessful projects also inform our technology roadmap. Are there ideas 
or sectors or opportunities that haven't been captured in previous calls and that we then need to design a call that actually casts the net broader and deeper to allow these projects a, a greater chance of being successful and being commercialized in Alberta. Yeah, thanks, Steve. That's a really, uh, really important point. And I would say another question that we get sometimes, and maybe just for everyone's uh, information, we don't um, black. If, if you submit an application that that doesn't fit with this call for proposals, um, and and it's great if you put that that opportunity on our radar screen. But just to be clear, you, you, if you submit an application and you're not approved here or not even shortlisted here, you're not blacklisted, and it won't affect any future submissions that you provide in future competitions. So there's the the downside is I'd say fairly low in terms of uh, putting a submission in that you think is related. Of course, it takes time to complete the submission, and that's something you have to think about. Thank you. Uh, we've had a couple questions come in about the technology readiness level. Um, can you explain a little bit more about um, what ERA looks for in TRL levels of submissions? Yeah, that's another really good conversation. Um, I, I don't want to get too wrapped around the axle in terms of defining very specifically the the TRL levels that that we look at everybody's definition of well definition and even interpretation of common definitions of TRL is a little bit different but I, I'd say the, the better way to put it you know if you want if you want to kind of force me to put uh, numbers to it in terms of the TRL spectrum we're looking at bringing opportunities from whatever stage they're at right now, and whether that's at the bench scale or in the lab scale, we wanna bring them up to around TRL, I'd say, you know, seven, eight, or nine, the, mostly the latter end of the TRL spectrum. Now, now, you may think, well, what about TRL six? And again, everybody's interpretation of the TRL ladder is is a little bit different. So I would say if you're looking, if you've got a technology that's ready to be put into the field, into a real operating condition for field testing, for a, a, a field pilot, for demonstration, or for a first of kind commercial implementation, then there's a good chance it'll fit from, from that perspective. I mean, that doesn't guarantee that it'll be shortlisted, doesn't guarantee it'll be a highly competitive opportunity. Um, but from a TRL perspective, if, if by the end of the project, you're putting it into the field for some sort of pilot or demonstration or deployment, that should fit from a TRL perspective. And, and again, building on the slide around partnerships, there is an opportunity for us to share your proposal. And if it is an earlier stage, there's other players in the innovation ecosystem that may be more appropriately aligned with uh, investing in that project to bring it closer to a stage that is more aligned with our mandate. So again, think of this as an opportunity to raise awareness of your project. And we do see ERA's role in our partnerships is allowing us to create a pathway for those projects throughout the ecosystem and not just a on-off switch at our door. Great. Uh, we had the next question come in from Mark Dunn. Um, would project funding from the Natural Gas Innovation Fund be considered as private industry cost share under this call for proposals? Yeah, I, I think it's a fairly quick answer to that. And uh, to the extent that my understanding of the natural gas innovation fund is correct the the funding for projects that are awarded in ngif's competition are provided by the members of ngif which are industry operators primarily and that includes upstream as well as midstream and downstream and so yes those funds in our process will be considered um private or industry funds and are eligible for matching. And, and I should probably note also on that regard that um, the while our call for proposals is very well aligned with the NGIF $3 million funding competition, um, there are some differences. And I think it's worthwhile noting that even the, the members of NGIF process, those that are putting funding into um, the projects that NGI funds, they may have other projects that 
they can't get funded through their own fund for, but are important opportunities at their operator sites. Um, and so the NGIF members are, are eligible to apply to ERA for funding consideration. So the answer is kind of uh, yes and, and more in that regard. Perfect. The next question comes in from Ryan Hutchinson. Uh, can companies and or organizations outside of Alberta and Canada partner with Alberta-based companies for this call? Uh, the quick answer is yes, absolutely. We've, we've seen some very successful opportunities where um, for example, and this is just one example, a technology provider from outside of Alberta partners with a local industrial operator, a natural gas pro producer, processor, or we've seen it in other industries as well. And those can be very successful partnerships. Now, that, those aren't the only type of partnerships that are successful, but certainly um, neither the applicant nor um, partners in the application strictly all need to be based in the province of Alberta. The next question comes in from Aaron Powell. If you're a service provider, RTO, or consultant, can you be involved in more than one submission as long as you're working with different technologies or tech providers that fill different needs in the natural gas supply chain? Yeah, so there's a there's a note in our guidelines document, and we don't have it here in the slide, and it's to the effect that there are really no restriction on the number of applications any one applicant can provide. Now, I know the nature of this question is a, is a little bit different, but it's kind of an extension of that in the sense that if you are a service provider and you're working with multiple uh, partners, for example, or applicants that want to provide a submission to ERA's natural gas challenge, that's that's perfectly okay on our side. Uh, the, and, you know, far be it from me to tell you how to do your business, but I think it's worthwhile pointing out that the relationship you have amongst different partners is 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 really between you and, and those partners. We don't, we're sort of agnostic to whether you're a service provider to one or 10 or 15 or 20 different uh, applicants. Um, it, but th that's a, a relationship that you'll have to establish with that one or those 15 different uh, um, partners that, that you're talking to right now. Great. Uh, the next question comes in from Sid Abma. Uh, what particular industries is the program looking to focus on? Uh, so I, you, I'd be happy to to help if you wanted to provide a um, follow up clarification in the in the questions pane there. I'll take my stab at it here, and and really it's it's a sort of it's a bit of a cheeky answer, and I apologize for that. But really, we're targeting Alberta's natural gas industry primarily. Now that's that's fairly broadly defined as 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 we mentioned already in terms of um, upstream, and that's you know production, wellhead, um, and, and you know also all the way to downstream and and use. So you know we've we've mentioned some examples around. Um, some, I guess, maybe peripheral industries like the transportation industry or the, I, you wouldn't call the, the downstream or midstream natural gas sector peripheral industries. Um, but I, I'd say it's, it's really the natural gas industry uh, in the, the broadest sense or uh, in a very broad sense uh, of, of thinking. Now, I, I may not have answered your question there, and I apologize if I didn't. So, so if you've got a clarification or if I didn't quite interpret that correctly, you're you're welcome to follow up on the questions pane or follow up with us afterward. The next question comes in from Nico Dursima. Uh, can we have more than one submission as projects if they are in on the side of a larger project? Uh, I, I, again, I apologize and uh, I'm, I'm not 100% sure I fully understand what the question is. But the, the quick answer is you can have more than one submission. You can submit more than one project. Now, on that note, I, my, what I would encourage folks to do is rather than uh, take a shotgun approach and say, hey, I've got 20 projects and I want to toss them all in there just to see what sticks, it's worthwhile high grading the opportunities internally and uh, really carefully going through our guidelines document and and the criteria and trying to assess which projects you've got on the docket internally that you think will be 
best aligned with ERA's natural gas challenge. And now, again, having said that, you're you're welcome to submit multiple applications. Where where it can get a little bit tricky is if you submit. We've seen this before, and and I don't know if this is what you're thinking, but if if applicant submits a number of different applications that are very slight variations of each other. For example, if it's the same technology with the same industry partner, um, but it's at uh, two different sites or three different sites and you submit three different applications, that it can make it a little bit difficult for our evaluation team um, to, to decide which is the best application or um, what the best path forward is in terms of um, selecting one or more applications. So uh, if you are going to submit multiple applications, I'd, I, I would encourage you to make sure that there's a, a distinct and a unique value proposition in each of the applications that you're submitting. So I, I, again, I hope that answers the question, but uh, feel free to, to clarify if, if it didn't. Thanks, Mark. Uh, the next question comes from Rick Nelson. Um, are renewable natural gas initiatives eligible? Uh, yeah, thanks, Rick. And I, it was on one of our previous slides. I, I don't think we'll flip back to the slide. Uh, I may or may not have mentioned it verbally, but uh, yes, that's a good question. So augmenting the supply of natural gas, whether it's for internal use or for exports with either renewable natural gas or synthetic natural gas is something that we, we anticipate to see some submissions in and something that uh, I think would be eligible. Thank you. We've had a couple of folks ask about a uh, timeframe of project execution. Can you maybe elaborate a little bit on that? Sure. I can offer some thoughts and and similarly again, if uh, if there's something that I've missed or you'd like further clarification, please uh, feel free to let us know. So once the proposals are approved by our the projects are approved by our board of directors, um, the the next step is, we, well, we, first of all, we send out a, a letter uh, indicating that the project has been approved for funding and providing some more information around the timelines and uh, funding conditions, if there are any, and the path forward in there, as well as, again, assigning an advisor that will be working with the each of the recipients uh, throughout the course of their project. Uh, so in terms of the timelines, we, we generally provide uh, a period of about somewhere between three and six months in order for the legal agreement to get executed. Uh, and then the projects themselves have a period of three years uh, for to, to, to be completed. Um, and that's that's outlined in our guidelines document. We're looking for projects that are no more than three years in length. And, and then from sort of a milestone to milestone basis, the, the timelines of those are very much on a project by project basis or on in, uh, the, based on the needs of the individual project. In some cases, we see projects where there are fairly frequent milestones that might be every six months or um, you know one or two times a year. In in other cases, we we might see projects where the milestones are spaced out by uh, a year or even longer than a year, a year and a half or so. Um, and and that's that's a conversation that we can have after the project has been approved for funding, and we try to find something that meets the the needs of the recipient the cash flow needs of the recipient but balances that with the the i guess the administrative burden if you will or the the work associated with putting in a milestone progress report and an invoice and and all of that uh, kind of thing so the timelines between milestones are variable from project to project and the piece i would add is that when we begin the evaluation we want to see projects that the expectation is that the outcome, outcomes can be delivered in that three-year period. But experience has taught us that innovation is messy and there are can be unforeseen circumstances beyond the control of either ERA or the proponents. And so I would add that there is some flexibility. Uh, we've seen mergers and acquisitions uh, change sort of the, the, the governance and the funding uh, models within organizations, uh, projects can uh, be based on the assumption of the certain delivery dates of uh, technologies that beyond circumstances beyond anyone's control, they can be delayed. So 
we also recognize that we want to deliver the ultimate outcome. If you've been successful, if your technology has stood out from the hundreds of other applicants as the uh, promising idea, we really do want to see it through to success. And so there is some flexibility there. The key thing though at the front end, what the reviewers are looking for, is this a reasonable expectation in terms of the projects? And can we, is there the commitments uh, that all the conditions of success are in place to actually deliver the outcomes and the timelines that, uh, that are being proposed? But there is some flexibility as the projects evolve. Yeah, thanks, Steve. That's a really important point. Actually, further to that point, there's one specific situation that I wanted to mention, and, and this is this is described in our guidelines document, but I think it's um, probably worthwhile sharing with everyone. And that is, in for some types of industrial operations, and I'll pick on in particular, and pick on isn't the right word, but I'll mention particularly petrochemical facilities. We know that petrochemical manufacturing facilities have high uptimes, and in, in many cases, they have long time periods between facility turnarounds. And if you want to implement something at that facility, oftentimes it has to be done within uh, whatever, a one week window every 18 to 24 months or whatever the, the, schedule, the turnaround schedule is for that particular facility. So those timeframes, um, hitting those timeframes is, is important. And so what we've mentioned in the guidelines document and what I wanna reiterate here is that if you've got a, a good idea or a project that you wanna bring forward related to a petrochemical facility or, or really any other uh, facility that, that has similar issues, we are, we are comfortable um, discussing uh, potential uh, delay or um, timing of the project such that it can align with facility turnarounds. We don't, we don't want, you know, we know that our, our timeframes are, are tight and we know that innovation doesn't always happen exactly on our timelines, but we want to be able to work with the, the timelines of innovation that's already out there and we don't want um, these timelines to be an impediment to, uh, to putting novel technology or important opportunities at facilities that have um, tight turnaround schedules and turnarounds that are what you would maybe say is few and far between. Thanks, Mark. Uh, we've had quite a few folks ask about um, the first-in-kind technologies. And for example, if you're combining different technologies in a, a new configuration that hasn't been done elsewhere, uh, would this new configuration be eligible? Yeah, so maybe I'll start by answering that specific question uh, and um, and then uh, maybe provide a little bit of thoughts and more generally speaking. So specifically, if you're talking about um, uh, configuring one or more uh, proven technologies, commercially available technologies in in a new uh, configuration or a new way uh, that's that's innovative or that has uh, that has some sort of uh, risk associated with it, novelty associated with it. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think that that's something that could fit into the the quote unquote first of kind category. Uh, it, you know, I, I think it's also worth mentioning, and we go into a little bit more detail in the guidelines document about this. Wh what we want to avoid in some senses is um, uh, the, the deployment or uh, widespread adoption, increasing the market share of commercially proven, commercially available, off-the-shelf technologies, where really the only gap for further deployment is a financial barrier. So we always want to see that there's some sort of risk associated with the project or some sort of justification and need for ERA's dollars to come in and help de-risk that innovation. So one example exactly as you've mentioned, Isabella, and, and was mentioned in the question is, uh, is a a technology or a combination of technologies that are commercial um, but are being demonstrated or deployed in a new way that's innovative or novel. Another is in some cases we've seen opportunities that have maybe been commercially deployed 
uh, off continent or in the southern United States, but have never been tested in Alberta's climate with the climate variability that we see from season to season and, and even year to year. Uh, and so sometimes a first of kind can be something that's been done elsewhere, but it's the first time it's ever been demonstrated or deployed in the province of Alberta for some very specific reason. So that's a cu couple examples, and again, I hope that's uh, helpful. Great. Uh, we've had another question come in kind of on that same line. Uh, what if this, can this application be part of an ongoing project? Uh, so I'm I'm not entirely sure what you mean by that question. And I apologize again if I misinterpret it. Um, but you know, I, I mentioned on a previous slide that our funding is on a go forward basis. So we, we cannot, um, award or contribute to costs that have been incurred in the past or even to costs that are being incurred now until the time that ERA's funding approval is made. Now, of course, with, with any project that's ready or almost ready to move to the pilot stage or demonstration stage or, for that matter, the commercial deployment stage, there's probably been some work that's already underway, whether it's a feasibility study or front-end engineering design or something like that. And uh, of course, it, it's uh, we those are the types of projects that, that we want to see. And so if, if it's ongoing from that regard or the next you know, phase of development in in a project. Um, I think that that absolutely fits. But but again, be careful if it's something that you're in the middle of constructing right now, but you've just kind of run out of money. Um, then it, it it may not fit. But you know, depending on the specifics of the situation, we may we may want to have a quick conversation just to kind of tackle that down. Great, thank you. Maybe one thing I could add to that question, and it's just a reminder to everybody out there, is that you know this is uh, a very competitive process, and while the answers may seem vague, it's because we recognize that we're not aware of all the opportunities out there. And back to sort of our earlier response is that you know it's an eight-page initial response. Um, if you, after listening to all we've said today, when you go through the guidelines, you have a strong belief that you fit in this call, we encourage you to submit uh, your project and let uh, us evaluate it uh, for two reasons. One is it may be that gem of an idea that we just didn't com contemplate and it should move forward, um, but it also gives you the opportunity to receive some feedback in terms of you know, why it wasn't accepted, uh, where the gaps are. And finally, it also gives us an opportunity to refer to someone else in the ecosystem that could maybe help you find a customer. Uh, uh, point to the fact that um, you really don't have a, a management team in place that could take this technology to a commercial stage or whatever the gap is. So um, recognize that it is a very competitive process so it's uh, and we're very hard markers um, but on the other hand it's useful to if you've in good conscience you've read everything you're convinced that there's a, an alignment submit the application thanks steve uh, the next question comes in from kia memarzade um, the project should be deployed in Alberta, but does this mean all research and work needs to be done in Alberta, or is it possible to be carried out outside of province? Yeah, thanks for that question. Uh, I I think I'd perhaps meant meant to elaborate on a, a little bit earlier, but uh, this is a good opportunity to do so. So yes, the the answer is that um, not all of the project work has to happen in Alberta. Ultimately, what we want to see is if there's steel in the ground, a, a pilot plant being built, demonstration, whatever the case is, we want that to happen in Alberta. And we want the, the benefits of that to accrue to the province of Alberta in terms of greenhouse gas emissions reductions, uh, employment benefits, uh, improving the competitiveness of Alberta's natural gas industry. But 
it it doesn't have to and you know we we've said that technologies can come from anywhere and so if a you know for example a prototype is being built in some r d facility in um in the united states for example uh and that some of that work needs to be finished off the prototype needs to be scaled up or manufactured or whatever the case is outside of the province of alberta and then brought into the into alberta to be deployed or demonstrated at an, an Alberta site, um, that's that's fine. And that's something that we've seen before in, in a number of our um, project configurations. But ultimately, you know, and I'm repeating myself a little bit, but we want to see the, the benefits accruing to the province of Alberta in terms of, uh, as I said, the greenhouse gas reductions and the economic benefits. Thanks, Mark. And uh, we just had a couple folks ask about uh, IP protection. Yeah. Okay. So that's that's another good question, and this this may be one that's worthwhile to follow up offline if if the answer isn't perhaps as detailed as um, as is necessary here. So our interest is not to own any intellectual property in normal normal circumstances, and in 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 fact for all of the projects that we've completed in our portfolio, we don't have any interest in taking an IP ownership position. However, I, it, I should note that there are some provisions in our legal agreement around uh, us wanting to ensure that the, the outcomes and the, um, outco the outcomes and the benefits of the technology are made available for the betterment and for the benefit of the province of Alberta. So in the legal agreement that you sign, you'll see that there are some requirements around producing uh, what we call a commercialization and technology transfer plan. And in that plan, we want to see how you as the recipient, um, after having developed and demonstrated the project, plan to make the technology available for the broader benefit of the province of Alberta through licensing, partnerships, uh, whatever your business model is and that kind of thing. And so there are, there are some, we, we have some clauses in there that allow us, I think, to some license or some opportunity to um, to do something with the intellectual property in the case that you uh, have used this these dollars, these public dollars to benefit your company and your technology, but then effectively um, put the technology on a shelf or don't make it appropriately available through reasonable licensing rates or partnerships or whatever the case may be. So that I know that's that's it's just kind of a brief overview, but really in normal circumstances, we don't want any ownership of intellectual property. Thanks, Mark. Okay, so thanks very much for fielding those questions, Isabella. Um, that brings us to the end of this webinar. Uh, we are, I think, one minute before the hour, and so I want to wrap up with a, a couple closing thoughts. Um, the first is thank you very much for your interest and your participation today. We're very excited by the number of people that are on this call and hope to see some really uh, exciting submissions uh, by the deadline. Uh, another thing I wanted to mention that's not on this slide is if you go on to our website and click the link into the IMS system, that's where you'll find all of the templates, uh, all of the guidelines, documents, and all of the information that's necessary. And from there, again, if you have any questions, and, and even uh, after this uh, webinar is completed, if you have unanswered questions, and you've reviewed the supporting documentation, you've looked at the template, but you still don't have an answer to your question, you're more than welcome to email us or contact us by email at applications at eralberta.ca and we'll try to make sure that we get to all responses in a timely fashion. Uh, final note is that we hope to have the webinar posted to our website by the end of this week. And thank you once again, and I hope everybody has a wonderful day.